So we'll begin with um, about a half hour meditation. I'll do a little guiding in the beginning, um, but I really encourage you to just really trust yourself as we practice tonight, to really trust your own, um, your own instincts and, uh, and my one instruction is to invite your whole self into the room and into this practice period, wherever you are. Don't just bring the meditator in. You can bring in all the parts of you, the parts that you are not so fond of, the parts that you would rather um, ignore, um, the parts that don't really align with the, the good yogi part. So I just really encourage you to really warmly invite your whole self into your practice tonight. And I'll do that too. I'm just going to ring the bell once to start and once at the end just to center us a little. So as we sit together tonight, I just invite you to find a posture that truly supports you, that really allows you to be here, and that allows you to practice with a kind of easy receptivity. Just allow yourself to be here and really appreciate that when we come together like this, we give support to each other and we get support from each other. And just to have that as part of our appreciation, part of our feeling of the goodness of being together. And just allow yourself to come into the body and just inhabit it with as much kindliness as you can. And in our practice tonight, let's just investigate how it is to just have this sort of receptive awareness to allow our sensations to arise and pass away, our thoughts, our emotions. So often when we practice, there's a real tendency to try to be the good yogi. That we see some striving. That there's that, that little undercurrent of not good enough yet. So just see if we can just allow that to be in the background. And just practice with this kindly receptive awareness that doesn't have to do anything. We just have this awareness that recognizes what's occurring in the present moment and just allows it to be, allows it to arise 
and then pass away. So our attention is relaxed and it's kindly. And we just trust ourselves and trust awareness. We can just be with this mind and this body as it is in this moment. And you can trust yourself to know what best supports you in your practice. So if it's useful to use the breath as a support, use the breath as a support. We're just kindly allowing awareness to know the present moment's experience.
So take a minute to stretch, reposition yourself. And um, if you're willing to uh, put your camera on, it's always nice for us to be able to see each other. See who's in the room and just connect. Shelly has been using um, this book, Sharon Salzberg's Faith as the kind of um, basis for our uh, discussions for the next couple of months. So that's what I'm going to um, talk about this evening. And I am planning to leave sufficient time so that we can really have a discussion about, um, about this. And um, I want to begin with um, a quotation that has been inspiring me since I first saw it posted two years ago um, at the site where George Floyd was killed. And the quote is, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world. And you have to do it all the time. This is the great Angela Davis. You have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world. And you have to do it all the time. This to me is one of the clearest examples of what we mean by faith in the Buddhist tradition. Faith, and the word in Pali is sada, S-A-D-D-H-A, literally means to place the heart upon. So faith is a choice. Um, many of us have, um, grown up with the idea that um, faith is kind of a, a set of beliefs that um, that we have. But really, in the, in the Buddhist tradition, it's not, um, faith is, is not so much a, a set of beliefs as a, a choice, a choice where we, we place the heart on. It's choosing the guiding principles and values of our lives. And we orient to what we identify, sort of like our own North Star, that that's what faith is. We, we choose the values, we choose what we're going to place our heart on, and we orient, orient to it. So in Angela Davis's quote, placing the heart upon a radically transformed world requires us to act on that vision over and over and over again. And that is quite literally keeping the faith. And some of you have heard me say before that uh, in life we get to choose between two bumper stickers. And the first bumper sticker is no good deed goes unpunished. And the second bumper sticker is, no act of kindness is ever wasted. And you, know, you can choose the clever, cynical sticker, no good deed goes unpunished. And thanks to confirmation bias, that, um, that phenomenon that, you know, uh, in which we selectively notice whatever agrees with our expectations. Um, you know, we can reinforce our, our cynicism. 
we can look for all those examples where we've chosen, uh, and we've done something and uh, we discover some blowback or uh, we see it in, in other, other people. Or you can choose the, the second uh, bumper sticker, no act of kindness is ever wasted and confirmation bias again is going to re excuse me, reinforce our belief that planting seeds of kindness is worthwhile. So what do we place the heart upon? And some people might decide that cynicism is the safe, smart choice. Don't expect good deeds to bring anything but heartache. Don't make yourself vulnerable. This sort of incredibly defended, um, no expectations, a kind of pessimistic worldview, very safe. Um, or you could choose kindness and see that acting kindly benefits the actor, regardless of the consequences. That when we act with kindness, we feel better. We benefit ourselves. And that the habit of kindness is in itself life affirming. So this again is, is that sort of choice that we have about faith. What are we going to choose? So it's always active. It's about how we orient our lives. What do we choose to place our heart upon? What guides our actions? And many of you know Steve Armstrong, who has come in and who's based in, in um, Maui, but uh, for many years came to um, Minnesota to teach the annual retreat. And Steve used to always say, whenever we're considering something, uh, whenever we're making choices, we should ask if, if our choice is in alignment with our highest values. And it's a very simple way of, of going about making choices. And I was asked, is this in alignment with my highest values? And you might say that your highest value is living a life of integrity. That's what you place your heart on. And then you can ask, you know, is this, is this act in, uh, in alignment with living a life of integrity? You might decide that, that the thing that you're going to primarily place your heart upon is non-harming. So is this act in alignment with not harming myself, not harming anyone else? And I, uh, as I was thinking about um, faith and thinking about talking with you this evening, um, I was thinking a lot about Paul Farmer who died this week. And not everyone um, may know Paul Farmer. He was the founder of Partners in Health. And um, he died very unexpectedly at the age of 62 in Rwanda, died in his sleep apparently of a cardiac event. Um, but Paul Farmer um, founded Partners in Health, which is this extraordinary organization that believes uh, as an act of faith, everyone has a right to health care. And what was so remarkable about Paul Farmer was he began his work in, in Haiti. And um, he was really instrumental in setting up clinics there for people with AIDS. And this was in the early aughts when you know, there was just beginning to, um, sort of the new AIDS, AIDS meds started in 95, but really in the early aughts, they were um, pretty reliable, didn't have to be refrigerated. Um, and the sort of common wisdom, but you had to take them every day. And the kind of common wisdom at that time was that, well, you can't do that in rural areas. You can't do that with people who are unsophisticated. Um, you know, that, that the, these, because the issue was with the, the uh, HIV medications, if you stopped taking them, the virus could mutate and then you 
um, that you not only would have a mutated virus, but you could pass on a mutated virus that would be drug resistant, okay? So there was this real idea that people, the only people who should get HIV meds were people who you were absolutely sure would take them every day as directed. So the common wisdom was, so you can't do this with rural people. You can't do this with uneducated people. And Paul Farmer just didn't believe that um, people wouldn't kind of rise to the occasion and do what would keep them healthy. And Tracy Kidder wrote a great book about 2009, 2010 called Mountains Beyond Mountains. And it was about Paul Farmer and having people who would go to these rural areas and bring people their, their AIDS medications and they would take it. They would take it as directed. And I mean, and he, he just worked so much with local people. It wasn't sort of the great savior coming in to, um, to save people. It was like, how do I work with the people who are there on the ground, who know their community, who know the best way to get things done? How do I work with them? And how do I help them get the training to do even more? So, I mean, this is what was so revolutionary about um, partners in, in health. I mean, it's, he just said, everyone wants to be healthy. People want their families to be healthy. They'll do what they need to do. And this really went against the grain of a lot of mainstream ideas about providing health care in under-resourced areas. And Paul Farmer not only um, went on to do great work in, in Haiti, but also in, um, in Rwanda and um, set up schools, schools of nursing, schools for doctors. And there was this, this, this incredible faith in local people that he, um, he worked with them as, um, as one of them and just you know, always asking them like, what do they need? It was, it was just such a, um, a remarkable model and um, partners in, in, in health. It's a, it's a big organization. Gates gave it a lot of money. A lot of philanthropists have put a lot of money in it. And he always went back and did work in the field. Um, the people who run the organization for people in nonprofits were not paid, you know, exorbitant salaries. And um, when I was, I was just so, so saddened by his death, and I thought he was everything a human being should be. He truly was everything a human being should be. And it is just such a, um, a beautiful thing to see how his, um, how he placed his heart upon um, this idea that we all Everyone, every human has a right to health care, and and how he um, was able to work with communities to make this happen and inspire other people to um, to take on um, sort of his vision to place their heart upon this idea that everyone deserves um, health care. Health care is a human right. What a great thing to place your heart on. And there's that very famous um, sutta, one of my, my favorites, many people love this one, where um, the Buddha's cousin, Ananda, who is his, uh, his attendant. And um, at one point, Ananda says to the Buddha, O Venerable Lord, it seems to me that having good friends is half the holy life. And the Buddha says, oh, no, Ananda, don't say that, Ananda. That is not correct, Ananda. Having good friends is the whole of the holy life. And this idea about having spiritual friends, having, having people who share the same faith as, um, as you do, who place their heart on the same sorts of values that you do. That this is really so important 
to um, to our sense of well-being and to our being able to um, move forward uh, on our path. So that when we come together here you know, on, on Wednesday night and we come to practice, we really come to give support to each other, to get support from each other, you know, to live the holy life, to live the life of being in alignment with our deep values, that we live our faith and we support each other in our, our faith. And this just has, has seemed to me to be so important for us to recognize the, the great value of Sangha. You know, sometimes in um, in Buddhist traditions, we really get caught up in the idea of seclusion, and we think that this is kind of a solitary. Um, you know, every every person out for themselves, kind of. You know, you just make your way, and. You know, actually, when the Buddha talked about seclusion, he talked about seclusion from the hindrances, about really not being assaulted by um, greed and aversion and restlessness and, um, and torpor and doubt. That's what seclusion is, is about. And it's not that we don't need solitary time and it's not that solitary time doesn't restore us um, because it is one of the great great um, parts of our our practice but it's also really really important to take to heart the notion of of sangha the notion of, of being part of a a community of beings who place their heart on living a noble life, a life of integrity, a life of non-harming, a life of compassion, a life of helping others. And right now, I think, when we are so ready to be done with a pandemic that is not yet done with us, when we are feeling alarmed by the assaults to our democracy, when we are feeling really brokenhearted over the unending gun violence, both state sanctioned and otherwise, and when incalculable suffering appears imminent as a consequence of uh, the climate crisis, it is exactly at this time when we are feeling so um, besieged that what we place our hearts on matters. It matters for ourselves. It matters for those who come after us. And it really helps when we can do this together. So I want to conclude with um, a poem by the uh, brilliant Buddhist practitioner, scholar, and eco-philosopher Joanna Macy. And this is a poem that has really been a touchstone for me and for my faith in the last few years. It's, it's a poem called Grace, and it's in her book, Active Hope, How to Face the Mess We're In Without Going Crazy. And I will read it. When you act on behalf of something greater than yourself, you begin to feel it acting through you with a power that is greater than your own. This is grace. Today, as we take risks for the sake of something greater than our separate individual lives, we are feeling graced by other beings, and by earth itself. Those with whom and on whose behalf we act give us strength, 
and eloquence and staying power we didn't know we had. We just need to practice knowing that and remembering that we are sustained by each other in the web of life. Our true power comes as a gift like grace because in truth it is sustained by others. If we practice drawing on the wisdom and beauty and strengths of our fellow human beings and our fellow species, we can go into any situation and trust that the courage and intelligence required will be supplied. I'll read the last part of this again. Those with whom and on whose behalf we act give us strength and eloquence and staying power we didn't know we had. We just need to practice knowing that and remembering that we are sustained by each other in the web of life. Our true power comes as a gift like grace because in truth it is sustained by others. If we practice drawing on the wisdom and beauty and strengths of our fellow human beings and our fellow species, we can go into any situation and trust that the courage and intelligence required will be supplied. And that to me is really a declaration of faith, of faith that together the wisdom and the courage to work with any situation will be supplied if we trust our fellow human beings and our fellow species. And so I, for me, that is something to really place the heart upon. And so I, um, I just would invite you to, um, to share um, what you placed the heart on, what you, how, you know, um, how faith shows up in, in your life. So please just unmute yourself and, um, and share. And it's really an act of generosity to, um, to share with, um, with others because this is really what we're trusting each other as fellow human beings sharing what we, what we place the heart upon. The Buddha said once to some people, ehi pasiko, which means see for yourself, come and see for yourself. And it's exactly what you said when um, there's this very famous sutta where he's talking to these people called the, the Kalmans. Um, and, um, you know, they're saying all these teachers come and they give us teachings about, you know, what we should believe and, and uh, they, they contradict each other and who's right. And the Buddha said, you know, you should never take any um, any teaching on authority or because of the reputation of the person who uh, who is speaking. But you need to see for yourself. You need to see, like, what is the life worth living? Who is it that lives a life that you would want to emulate? And that's exactly what you're doing, Andy. Just, you know, like using your own experience to see, you know, what is it? that would be the worthwhile choice. What is it that I would place my heart on and seeing how people make choices and how they live their lives and what the consequences are. And, um, you know, for me tonight, talking about Paul Farmer, reading about him and seeing, seeing what, um, what could be accomplished by someone who had such, um, um, willingness to 
work with people and um, not kind of accept the uh, accepted wisdom about who can um, who can take complicated medicines and who can't, you know, and, and that just, he, it's just, um, it really is to see for yourself. So, um, thank you for, for sharing that. That's, that's exactly consistent with what, um, we've been talking about here. I mean, there, there's a lot to really be alarmed about and concerned about and um, you know, we know that, that the news we consume, that it is all geared toward that, that we don't, um, you know, get the, the Paul Farmer stories, um, as part of the, the daily news. Um, so, so it's really important in our lives to look for people who are inspiring us look for look for the good look for happiness um one of my um pleasures daily is on facebook i get the dodo does anyone here know what the dodo is okay amy knows the dodo are all these stories about animal rescue and there are <clears throat> I mean, you could just see hundreds of stories of, of animal rescue, but they're just so wonderful about people who um, you know, find a dog by the side of the road and it really takes them a while to, to catch the dog and then to get the dog and to get the dog and the dog is really hostile and really frightened. And, um, you know, there's just these, these wonderful stories about, um, rehabilitating the animal, finding a permanent home for the animal. And um, it's not only, um, it's mostly dogs, but not, not entirely. Um, there have been some pig rescues and um, horse rescues and goat rescues. But, you know, I mean, it just, when I, I watch that, I think there are really good people in, in the world. Um, people who just go out of their way to take care of um, of animals that have been um, abandoned, and the other thing about um, that's so inspiring about this, and this has been my own experience with my own rescues, is um, you know getting an animal that has been so mistreated by other people, and finding that that animal is willing to give human beings another chance. I mean. It's just um, amazing sometimes to see that that animals who and you know this isn't true of, of every every animal some sometimes creatures are just um, so harmed and so damaged that they're they're not able to connect but so often they are and to see animals that have been so um, badly treated their willingness to give humans another chance is just so um, inspiring to me. And, um, and you know, like watching the dodo in the morning, which comes up on my Facebook feed, just makes me feel better about human beings. And so, you know, we just shouldn't forget those kinds of, of, um, of things, um, you know, listening to, um, music or last night I finally watched Summer of Soul, which I hope everybody gets a chance to um, to watch about this this huge um, music festival that took place in Harlem in 1969. And it was just so joyous. And the music was, I mean, there are just, we, sh we need to be doing things to um, support ourselves and to um, to enable ourselves to be resilient with all of the um, scary and difficult things that we are contending with, that um, that providing that sort of resilience building. And a lot of times we get that by being with um, friends, 
um, two-legged friends, four-legged friends, um, and, um, you know, just experiencing how good it is to be alive in this moment, um, you know, walking by the river, or I guess that, that, that sense of really taking the time to really bring our mindfulness to, um, to the goodness that we experience sometimes, to really, really take that in. Um, the um, neuropsychologist, um, Rick Hansen, so often says that um, we've evolved to have um, kind of Velcro um, for, the, um, for the bad and Teflon for the good. That so often uh, we take our good experiences and even the compliments that we get from people. We take them, uh, so, oh yeah, thank you, but we don't really take it in and we take the bad in. So one of our resilience practices can be, you know, taking in the good. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's something to, um, to really just be mindful of that when we have an opportunity to really see the good in ourselves or in another, to really appreciate that and, and take that in. And it gives us some ballast. That's such a, a beautiful example that sometimes there are people where they have really different beliefs than we have, maybe a really different theology, something that, that's just so different, but their values, what they have placed their, their heart on, the good that they do, that that's what, that's what we connect with. And when we can, can connect um, more and more with each other around what we do have in common, what we do share, then those differences may not be so significant. Um, yeah, I have, um, uh, I have made some connections with people who, who have ex very, very different religious beliefs. And in fact, someone who has come to my door um, pretty regularly up until the pandemic. And, um, and we would just, it was just always very, and I was always invited to come to the church, but this person just wished me well. And at one time I said, you know, I just lost a friend who had died. And this person who knocks on doors as part of her practice, you know, sent me this card. Um, saying, I'm really sorry that you lost your friend. It was just such a kind thing to do. And um, I have, have really appreciated um, just the kindness of this person saying, I know you have your, your own faith and I know you said you're a Buddhist. I just want you to know you'd always be welcome at my church and how are you doing? And, and um, sometimes she has her son and her husband with her. And it's just very... Um, it's just very pleasant. It's kind of good-hearted people meeting each other. And, um, and that to me was kind of, of unexpected that I would have this great um, affection. And, um, and she sent me one or two notes during the pandemic saying that she hoped I was, I was well. And uh, that's just very, uh, very touching and very kind. And, um, you know, unexpected. So, and it's it's her act of kindness to me, and I really feel that. I'll just take in the good of what Paul said about being together, belonging, seeing each other, feeling that connection, just really allowing, allowing the heart to open. really appreciating how it is to be together in this really wholesome way. Where we're really here for each other and for our own good. As Joanna said, If we practice 
drawing on the wisdom and beauty and strengths of our fellow human beings and our fellow species, we can go into any situation and trust that the courage and intelligence required will be supplied. And that brings us to our transformed world. So I'll, I'll share the merit in a second. I just want to also just remind people that next week, um, our session will start at 5.30 Central Time, which will be 6.30 Eastern Time, so that we can have a joint session with um, the Cambridge Insight Meditation Society, and Shelley will be speaking. So it should be really interesting to increase our Sangha. And I just want to thank everyone um, who came here tonight. Um, thank you for your presence and your, your sincere wholeheartedness in, in being here. And I will share the merit. So if there's any goodness to our practice, any benefit or blessing or merit, we would gladly, happily, joyfully share it with others. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away, every bit of it. We would share it with our parents, our teachers, our families, our friends, we would share it with our spiritual community. We would share it with the people we like and the people we don't like so much. We would gladly share any blessings with the people we know and the millions upon millions of people we have yet to know. And in addition to all the two-leggeds, we would joyfully share the merit with the four-leggeds, the many-leggeds, the winged, the scaly, the slimy, the finny. May all creatures find a path to peace. May all beings be free from suffering. So thank you all. And I hope you have pleasant sleep tonight. Thank you for being here. Take care. <laughs>